Good evening, everyone. On this episode, I'm joined by Adrian Maestas, bassist of Hand of Goro, a metal band with San Francisco roots. Uh, Adrian joins us today uh, to promote the band's recently released self-titled debut album. So, Adrian, welcome to Metal Mayhem ROC. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, that's awesome. So, uh, Adrian, listen, I'm not going to lie. My inbox gets flooded from all kinds of... Uh, you know, press agents, and they're just pushing all this new music all the time. And it takes a lot of effort to seek through all these things and try to find bands, new bands, let's say that you say, ah, that's in my kind of territory, my wheelhouse or things that maybe our listeners would like. So uh, the Hands of Goro press release came out, you know, uh, months ago. And I remember the first thing that caught my eye was the humor, because in the photo was you guys pushing that shopping cart down the street and you're in the front. And I said, okay, I think we got something here. What are these guys about? <laughs> and, and the rest is history. So, you know, it's uh, it takes a lot of credit to, uh, you know, to sift through all of this new material and really come up and find something um, that you like. And this one definitely piqued my curiosity and I'm glad that we got a chance to get you on and talk about the new album. So uh, congratulations, the new album is out, but you know, my first comment or question is, you know, Hands of Goro, what is it? Talk about what this is. What does it mean? Okay, well, uh, first off, the the photo you're talking about of them pushing me in the shopping cart, that was a good friend of ours named uh, Jen W.A. She, um, she took a lot of great photos of us that day, and she's a, been doing band photography for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, we took so many pic pictures that day. And at the end of the day, she knew before we even looked at any of the pictures, she knew that that was the photo. She was like, I already know which one it is. And sure enough, we sifted through the hundreds of photos, hundreds of photos. And we all agreed. We're like the shopping cart, of course. But anyways, uh, hands of Goro. So um, Goro is a character from the out, out world, uh, which is ruled by Shang Tsung. Uh, who was preceded, pre, uh, preceded by the great Kung Lao. Um, Goro is a half man, half dragon. Mm. And uh, he has four arms and he's like super big and strong. He's like mega buff and everything. Yeah, exactly. I brought my and, extra arms. Good. You got your extra hands. That's positive. Um, but yeah, basically we seek inspiration from the outworld so that we can bring chaos and disorder to the earth realm through our music and the inspiration from Goro and Shang Tsung. Where does all of that come from? Is this stuff you guys made up? Is this like stuff in sci-fi? Is this like reality? Is this like real factual stuff you guys are referencing? What is, what's is the, the background on all this? Video game called Mortal Kombat. Oh, okay. From back in the day. And, um, let me get my chair here. My chair is kind of, there it is. Chair. Anyways, um, so Mortal Kombat back in the day was a, and still an awesome video game. And uh, it just kind of, the inspiration uh, struck us. Uh, Hans Agoro, we do things in the reverse order. So uh, what we did first is we, uh, well, I got a phone call and it was offering me a gig that my other band couldn't make it. So the guy goes, do you have any other bands? And I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, what's your band's name? And I was, and I had just played Mortal Kombat that day at the bowling alley. And so, uh, so I was like, uh, my other band is called, it's called, uh, um, it's called Goro. No, it's not Goro. It's a, it's a ha handy, uh, ha ha hands of Goro. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. And so the guy was like, okay, we'll give you guys a 45 minute set at this festival. Okay. Okay, great. And I said, okay, now I need a band. So I got the gig, then I put the band together, but then we didn't have any songs. So we had to write some songs. So we came up with uh, most of the lyrics before we wrote any songs. And so we did everything completely backwards. We, we started the band, made a, had a concept, got the gig, um, you know, made up words, and then figure, tried to figure what kind of music are we going to make? I don't know. So how did you, that's pretty, that's actually an incredible story. Like you got put on the spot. The guy's like almost interviewing. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Like, what is your other band? Oh, uh, hands yeah, of Goro. Exactly. And then, yeah, we'll give you a 40. How, how long did you have from the time this guy offered you a gig till the gig itself? Um, I don't even think it was two months. Oh, wow. 
Wow. Yeah. So, um, so then enter Tom Draper, uh, who was uh, at the time he was not yet. This was probably 2015, 2016. <coughs> so, at the time he is not he was not uh, as well known as he is now. Uh, it was before he started playing in Carcass, uh, before he started playing in Spirit of Drift. He was uh, he was this uh, weird uh, British guy who showed up to one of the shows I was at. And he was like, hey, if you ever need a guitar player, let me know. And I'm like, guitar players? I got tons of guitar players. I play with Mike Scalzi and Angelo Trangali from Slaufeg like every week. So like, mm -hmm. I don't need guitar players. I got, you know, Flash, Speed, Riffs. I, I got buckets of that from the guys I'm playing with. Right. But then, um, but then turned out I got this gig, had, had this fictional band that I just made up. And then, so I was like, oh, I still have that dude's phone numbers. Yeah, so I called him up and I say, hey, man, you know, and I told him what the deal was. And he goes, uh, OK, so we have a name. We have a gig. We just need songs. And I said, let's write some songs, dude. And so uh, that's pretty much how it all happened. Well, And he was uh, he I think I read up that he, I guess, relocated to the Bay Area. So he is from the UK, but he's he's planted now in, in the West Coast. Yeah, he's from yeah. England uh, and he and his wife. Uh, moved to the U.S. Um, I mean, they're you know they decided to head west and chase the dream. Man, the American dream was like on their on their horizon. They saw it coming, uh -huh. and they uh, they moved out west, and um, they're doing very well. Yeah, that's a that's a cool story, man. That's a that's a different story. So you know, I know like, and listen, you've probably heard this before, but when I listen to the album, you know, it's. It's 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 an accessible album. It's the kind of metal that I personally like. But, you know, your initial reaction is, oh, well, it it sounds like this style or it sounds like that band or it sounds like it's metal from this area. And to be honest, it's a very, very difficult sound to define easily. I hear a lot of different things in there. You know, I hear, um, you know, I, traditional metal. I hear a lot of twin guitar maybe some early Iron Maiden sounding. I hear a lot of melody there. Of course, there's that, you know, uh, classic, you know, sort of new wave of British heavy metal sound at times. Then there's punk sign, some punk sound. You know, you got the epic tracks. There's some stuff that's very anthematic. So I guess, you know, comment on the sound you guys were going for and knowing this background now that you didn't have any music prepared, how the hell did you and Tom say, all right, well, this is the kind of music we're going to write, different from my other bands? We took the inspiration from Goro in the Outworld, and he sent these like these like energetic vibes to us through these portals that were opened up, and the music just like it just came, man. We didn't we didn't uh, we didn't sit there and go, oh, let's write a thrash song, or like, uh, you know, hey, let's make something, you know, uh, let's make this epic thing with a bunch of parts. You know, we didn't sit there and do that. We were just like. We were just making music, um, you know, dreaming about the sounds of quarters going into the video games and and all the noises that we hear in the arcades and 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 it, you know we didn't we didn't try very hard. We were just like, let's just play together and see what happens. What what's going to come out? And these are the things that came out. And um, we really, like I said, we weren't trying for any type of genre. We weren't trying to like, hey, let's write a punk song. Let's put the, you know. We're just like, hey, I got this riff. You got the cool. Let's do that. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Oh, that's not cool. Let's do that. And so we just kind of put all this stuff together. And uh, and that's what we have. You know, I mean, it's fortunate for all three of us that because um, all three of us are in other bands and stuff and we play, you know, all kinds of music. But this band is the easiest to write songs because, hey, we have a good time hanging out with each other, but also um it's it's effortless we just like we just sit in the room have a good time make some music push record we go hey there there's something there and we develop it a little bit and uh, again we're not trying we're not trying for a particular subgenre we're not shooting for you know uh we're not shooting for that blind guardian sound you know mm -hmm. we're not shooting for you know the the whatever the the third testament album you know, we're not, yeah. you know, we're not, we're not going for anything. We're just doing what we do naturally because, uh, cause we're all three, we're all three been around the block a few times and, you know, we, we know when it's working and we know when it's not working. So yeah, jump head first, go for it, 
see what happens, push record. If it sounds good, stick with it. If not, kick it to the curb. So let me ask you a question because we I want to go through the tracks on the album in, in depth. But, you know, from the time you guys started kind of noodling around to how long was the process to get, you know, songs together to come a, come along quickly? Or was it like an iterative process where maybe you had a couple songs and then you came back six months later? Like, how long did it take you guys to put this whole thing together, you know, leading up to this release, you know, just earlier this month? Well, we put out uh, we put out an EP in 2017 that had five songs on it that are all on the album. So mm -hmm. we we had these five songs in the can already, ready to go. And then, um, so like I said, that was like 2017. We had the, those were done. But then, um, you know, Tom went off to join Carcass. Um, I was doing my thing with my surf rock band and my other heavy metal band, Slaufeg. And uh, we were just, you know, we would jam together once in a while, but we really didn't have Hands of Goro really happening, you know? And so uh, when the pandemic hit, um, we were both just like clamoring at the bit to like jam, you know? So then um, Avinash, the drummer, He's uh he's a fixture in the San Francisco heavy metal scene. Mm. And he um I guess Tom had reached out to him and said, Hey man, you know, let's get together and jam. You know, we can wear masks and stuff, you know. So we we hung out, we just it was super casual, man. Like I said, nothing's forced in this band. So then Avinash said, Hey, you know, would you guys want to maybe re-record some of these songs that you had from the EP and re-record them with me? Because we started playing them a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And we're like, sure, yeah. So we recorded those uh, first couple of songs. And then uh, I was like, you know, well, Tom and I have some other stuff we could throw in there, too. So then we had one new song. And then there was another song that we had been working on that we never quite finished. So we finished that one and recorded that one. And then, uh, and then we had another song that we were just kind of tossing around. So we finished that one and recorded that one. And then next thing you know, we're like, okay, this is turning into a full-length album so so we're like are we gonna do this or are we just gonna like let it sit there and we're like oh okay let's let's put it out let's do it you know so that's kind of what happened and uh, where we're at right now is uh basically trying to um you know we're already writing music for the next album which mm -hmm. is good but uh we're just trying to get out there and let people know that we're uh we're a thing and we're available we're doing it there's only three of us and uh, we travel really well together <laughs> and uh, we don't smash equipment or anything. So, um, you know, we're just trying to get it out there, man. Trying to uh, we've got good. We've got good reception from a lot of uh, different um, folks, the the magazines and the websites and mm -hmm. um, Spain and and Puerto Rico and Mexico and and Europe and stuff. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it sticks and we can get out there and start showing off because uh, our live show is way different than the album. Let me tell you that. Uh, and and how, why so? Describe a little bit. Of, what do you mean by that? Well, um, one Thomas Draper is uh, one person, and he, on the album he plays like forty different guitars. Mm. But um, but in the live show, you know, there's only one of him, and so he just goes crazy on his own, and um, you know, trying to play as many guitar parts as he can. And he's got it all dialed in and everything. And uh, we struck, we try and structure our live show so that it's almost like a comic book come to life. So, you know, that's kind of what we're going for. Um, you know, if we can get better shows and we start making a little bit of money, we will definitely reinvest it into our live shows for sure. That's pretty cool. You know, Bruce Dickinson just put out his recent solo album. And a lot of that, it's called The Mandrake Project. And a lot of it is based off of a comic book series of, you know, uh, he had, uh, I think it's Stan Lee helped him write that. So a lot oh. of the illustration comes out through, um, through the songs, you know, he's actually done signings across the globe and that kind of thing. So there's definitely some correlation between the metal music and, and the comic stuff. So, you know, it's funny, you're, you're making me think of how you said you guys with like the video game concept. I don't know how old you are, but you know, I'm 50, almost 54, but my younger boys, when they were growing up, we would watch this show on the Cartoon Network called The Regular Show. And a yeah. lot of it was like, it's it's hard to find now. You could probably get it on YouTube. But a lot of it is these characters, these cartoon characters. 
They're kind of just playing video games and hanging out in the park. And then they play music and all this weird shit happens. These you know things come from outer space and it's just like almost like altered reality, but in like a setting and music that you could relate to. I would suggest you check it out. Sounds like you guys would appreciate that. You know, I have a little bit of fantasy with my metal. And um, one of the things that we like to do is, you know, hopefully when people listen to our music and they come see our shows, you know, they forget about the the day to day stuff that, you know, kind of brings us all down. And um, hopefully they get a kick out of us being silly on stage and on record. You know, I mean, we're just we're, like I said, we're having fun. And if other people can enjoy the references that we make and just kind of sit there for 30 minutes and like get a departure from the day to day worries and, and just absorb the music. I mean, that's why we're all here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I, again, we talked about the humor with the shopping cart, but some of the other photos, you guys kind of up against the the chain link <laughs> fence. And it was like you in the front with the glasses on and the one picture looking all tough in front of the stairway. <laughs> and the other one was one of the guys jumping off this cliff, uh, like, you know, look, it looked like, a you know, some sort of ledge there. I was like, oh, this, these are my kind of guys, man. They're out there just hanging out, having some fun. But um, talk about it, the recording, because I think there's a neat story out there about where you actually recorded the album in this sort of dilapidated formal naval, naval base or something. What's up with that? Uh, yeah. The city of Alameda, which is in the San Francisco Bay area is an Island that um, after world war one, they turned it into a, uh, a naval base. And um, cause you know, everybody was freaked out that like there was going to be an attack on the West coast. So all these military bases popped up on the West coast and this place has been, uh, God, it's been, a, it's been civilized for at least the past 30 or 40 years. And uh, there's a couple of small businesses out there. There's a couple of wineries and stuff. And uh, Avinash, the drummer, works in a place that has one of the giant warehouses. And it's a, just an old school military warehouse. And it's pretty cool because all of the the uh, uh, electrical and stuff is still there. So there's all this like 50s and 60s style electronics and lights and boop, 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 boop. And um, his, uh, his company that he works for, they were generous enough to allow him. I mean, warehouse is freaking huge, man. It's like the size of like three or four football fields, huge. And uh, they, I don't know what they used to build in there. It was probably an airplane hangar or something at one point in time. But um the, there's a bunch of these little offices in there and so many of the space is unused. And so they let our drummer Avinash use uh, one of the offices as a practice space. And so we were able to go in there um, during off hours, of course, and set up all the recording gear and uh, just kind of go for it. And that's how we captured a lot of the basic tracks, uh, mostly the drums and then, because uh, we want to get a good isolated drum sound, which um, which I think he was very successful. Uh, uh, drummer Avinash uh, engineered and mixed the entire album. Mm. Yeah, it was cool. All I did was sing and play bass. It was great. And then, um, so that's where we did most of the drums. And then uh, I have a rehearsal studio in San Francisco in the uh, uh, questionable neighborhood. And it's a couple couple floors below um, ground level, so it's nice and quiet. Mm -hmm. And that's where we did a lot of the bass and the vocals there and screamed and yelled. And uh, basically, again, we just had a good time. We didn't go in there thinking like, oh, man, I'm going to try and be like Rob Halford on this song. Or I'm going to, you know, try and I'm going to try and sound like the guy from Exodus. I'm, you know, we just went in and said, look, let's just do what we do. Push record. And then uh, and Avinash mixed it all together and made it sound great. Nice. And how about the album art? Because it's uh, it's kind of disturbing looking on the front. I guess that's Goro. And is there any uh, any any storyline behind the image in the front of the album? Yeah, well, that's um, Goro overlooking his um, his territory where the the village has been completely dammed and burnt, and he's got heads on spikes and stuff. He's he's basically proving a point that you know they're going to live in his territory. They're going to live in absolute fear because. Uh, he's the Archduke of Fear and uh, overlooks his uh, his kingdom with uh, an iron fist. 
That's cool, man. I like that. You know, it's and it it lends itself to the tracks because when you do l- read a little bit and you kind of kind of grasp the concept, you say, "All right, now I understand what the name Hands of Goro means. It's a character." Then you can start feeling it through some of the songs, and you hear sort of the some of the demonic laughter in certain parts, and these crazy noises coming out. But um, great background on this, Adrian. And I want to I want to get into the tracks because I've absorbed this album, you know five seven times already this week really really good strong stuff what i like about it it's it's an you're in and you're out it's like a 35 37 minute album eight songs it, you know everything flows really really nicely and um it's just well it well done with the the placement but let's go right through the track so the first one prince of shokan um just i love this as an opening track because it's kind of groovy and jammy it's got that abundance of power chords, and it's definitely a track that has that vintage hard rock feel. So it, you know, you're setting off the album in the right way. It introduces the sound of the band to you, and you go, "Okay, I like this. This is cool." So talk about about that track. <clears throat> um, that was the first one that we did, man. Uh, b- back in whatever 2016 or something, um, when the first time Tom and I got into a room together, we just we fired off that riff, and there it was just came from out of nowhere. The influence from the outworld came right through our hands that just, I mean, riffs started happening. And, um, and that was the first song we wrote. It's, it's usually the first song we play live. Uh, it's the opening number and usually not all the time. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and we just, uh, added a little bit of, uh, salt and pepper here to make it spicy, but it's basically, it's just a, just a riff and some guitars, man. There's, there's no real, um, there was no real like in, again. There was no really intent, yeah, to make these songs in this particular way. But that was the first one we, song we wrote together. It was the first. It's the first song on the album, and um, you know, the, uh, oh, uh, Goro is um, he is from an area, a territory in the outworld called Shokan, and he is uh, one of he was one of the first of his species, and uh, he's a half man, half dragon, and so he is elevated to royalty, and so he is the prince. Of Shokan. Okay, got it. So that's how we get introduced to what the character's role is. Then you get into yeah. Demonizer, and this changes the pace up because this one is fast, fast riffing, fast drumming, has that new wave of British heavy metal feel. I think what's killer is, and I still can't make it out, but it's like the three word pre chorus to the chorus that says Demonizer. And, you know, it's just a stellar, stellar track and the cool, trippy sound effects at the end. It's just very explosive. So, um, comment on that one um let's see demonizer is uh that's um goro um is spreading his influence to a young man who um feels the 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 strength of the evil coming through him and basically turns his back on his his family and his mother and uh and hands uh hands the people around him he hands them over to goro so that they can uh so that their souls can be consumed and uh, his very soul is consumed as well. It's a, it's a, it's tragedy, really. And um, but that's why we make it fast, because you know usually you think of like a tragic um, story is like slow and like doomy and gothy and stuff, you know, which is which are all cool things. But um, this one just came fast, and again, it's a barn burner. You know, riffs. The words were already there. I think. I think the words that came before this song as well, because um, what is it? Uh, uh, scales, um, teeth, and fire. Those are the words okay. that you were asking about. Because uh, Goro is a half man, half dragon. He's still got some scales. He's got. He's got big, crazy teeth. <laughs> and uh, and you know, there's fire all around, and everything's burning and torched and. You know, this this poor kid, you know, feels the the the, the influence of Goro coming through the outworld and, and just like his entire his chest is like deflating with like all the life is going out from him as he like turns over all of the people around him to uh, to Goro. So their souls can be consumed one by wow. one. Wow. This is some heavy yeah. stuff. And then we get yeah. into track three, Uncanny. This is one of my favorites because it's melodic and catchy. Got that main riff. I hear I hear Tommy Victor in prong in the vocal style. It's just Ooh. it comes to me sometimes. It's a style. It's got 
Um, the the cool time signature change in the middle into that kind of great guitar solo. And it's just Tom shines on this one. You really hear the guitar work, a lot of power chords towards the back end. And again, I hear that early Iron Maiden Paul Diano twin style in the back end. So uh, just totally. a good, big track there. Big track on Canny. Yeah. That was one that um, um, basically I had been writing songs for my other band, uh, Slaufeg, and and Uncanny was something that was happening, and I kept on building on it and just kind of like rearranging it and then redoing this way and another way and putting this part here and that part there. And uh, the arrangement that's on the album is effectively the arrangement that is on the demo or the EP that we put out in 2017. But um, it's got a little bit different guitar parts, a little bit different drum parts. Uh, some of the words are slightly different, but that's just something where um, I, it it took it took a lot of time for that one to come together, but that was something that I just I don't know I had this like I had this this thing inside of me that made me go to my studio. I was in the studio for weeks trying to get that one together, mm-hmm. and um, and then my other band Slaufeg recorded a version of that too, which is remarkably different oh. than the one here on the Hands of Goro album. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, it's on the uh, 2019 Slaufeg album called New Organic. Okay. On Cruise Del Sur Records. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uncanny. Good track. Um, the fourth track, 21st Century Plague. You know, it's funny, Adrian. When when I first heard this one the first time, I heard all these spoken passages in the background sounded like radio frequencies getting mixed up. And then my first reaction was, after the music kicked in and it felt a little proggy, I'm like, holy shit, I'm hearing like a reincarnation of Russia's 2112. This sounds like the beginning of it. I'm like, I swear to God, just so you know, as a listener, that's where my head goes for the first part of the track. Of course, once it gets kind of into that punk rock feel, it changes. But then you come back to that proggy feel at the end. So don't know if you set out to accomplish that, but that's what I took away from it. Well, I mean, I'm a huge Rush fan. I've been Rush fan since I was in high school, and I've gone to see every tour since then. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that that influence always comes through in my playing for sure. Um, you know, Geddy Lee is one of my like bass playing icons that I look up to. In fact, uh, in fact, on their very last concert that they um, played in L.A., I was there, and then. Wow. They put out a DVD um, about like the the last tour that they were doing and everything. And at the very very end of the Rush DVD, um, there's a scene where me and my friend are walking across the the arena, and you can see us in the background. It's pretty no, rad. I've seen I've I've watched that that film. I will have to take that yeah. back out and watch that scene again. That's incredible. It's the, at the very 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 end when the credits are rolling and stuff. There's like one. There's like two seconds where you just see me walking by in the back. And the first time I saw that in the movie theater, I freaked out and I screamed and there, and there was a bunch of, there was a bunch of other dudes sitting around me and I was like, oh. and they were like, what, what, what are you freaking? I was like, ah, uh, I think that was me. <laughs> I was like, holy smokes. That freaked me out. But yeah, rush is a big influence. And, um, but the 21st century plague, uh, I think we all know what that one means. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, there was a day in California where the sun never came out and the, the, or the entire sky turned orange for the whole day. The mm-hmm. sun did not come out. The entire sky was orange. I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was judgment day for sure. I was like, you know, if the T-1000 is going to bust out any minute and be like, <laughs> You know, I was waiting for like the the machines are going to, you know, Skynet has been activated. That's it. It's over. And um, thankfully, we're we're still here. But um, on that day, uh, Tom and I were texting vigorously and um, I was like 21st Century Plague. It's a song. And he was like, oh, what's it about? And I said, "Okay, well, this is what it's about. And we wrote the words right there on the phone. And then like that day him and I were just trading riffs over the, over the freaking telephone. And, uh, and most of the song just came out right there. Wow. That's funny. Yeah. 
it's a it's a good track. You know what you need in California? You need to go back to the days of Arnold's. Bring yes. back Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. He could take care of things out there. He did take care of things. He was he was the only governor in like the past I don't know how many years who actually balanced the budget mm-hmm. in California, so there was no deficit spending anymore, and everybody was pissed off because he cut everybody's funding. And what he did was he did on like one of his first uh, governor state of the state speeches, he had his freaking Conan sword. And he was like, nobody will be safe. Everybody's getting cut. And he had his Conan sword mounted above his chair in his office in Sacramento. It's, and it's no surprise there's that band called the Austrian Death Machine that writes songs in the spirit of Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, check them out. They're uh, they're on a major label, uh, Austrian Death Machine. Austrian um, Death Machine? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I can't remember who the main guy is, but he's from uh, a major band. It's just it's 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 not coming to me. They just put an album out, but uh, yeah, check it oh, out. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's a thing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They put a new album out, but the older albums he actually sings in the style of Arnold. It's pretty, you know, come to the chopper and all that kind of stuff. It's fantastic. But, There's um, a perfect scene around here called Arno Core, and it's all songs about Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. No. Oh. Yeah, they okay. play. They play when the wrestling matches happen. Yeah, yeah. So Pretty badass. Well, thanks for sharing that rush story. I'm gonna have to go back. But and before we get off that onto the next track, were you aware being at the rush show that maybe the cameras were filming down where you were? Or you had no fucking idea until oh, you were no, in the theater. For sure, there was cameras everywhere because yeah. it was the last. It was the last yeah. rush concert ever. Yep. And. Uh, and so, of course, I saved my nickels and dimes and bought the best seats I possibly could. And I was sitting right behind uh, Stuart Copeland. I was right behind um, uh, Danny Carey from Tool and uh, and Jack Black. Wow. So we were all sitting in the same area. And, and I, you know, I, I mean, I was, of course, I was wrapped up in the music and everything. Sure. But, uh, but, yeah, there was cameras everywhere. They were definitely filming. So. No. I I mean I didn't think like you know oh, maybe I'll be on there but you know yeah. when I saw myself I was like whoa it's crazy yeah to well, the very to the credits when the and when the end credits are rolling and there's like there's like some guy crying and then right after that there's just like two seconds of me walking around in the background I I I, I have my homework to do to go back to it stay <laughs> tuned on Metal Mayhem ROC in the future in the next couple of weeks we have a a special. A rock and roll detention episode coming out on the top 25 Rush deep tracks between my co-host and I and two guests, one from the Metal Voice in Canada and the uh, author from Canada, Martin Popoff, who's written a lot of books. So we all put our list together of our favorite deep tracks and we kind of geeked out. But that's for another time. Check it out. So back to the album. So the next track, You Have No Face, Uh, trippy sound effects start and end the song. It's got another one with that punk rock feel but uh what i find intriguing about this one it's got like this i don't know like 1960s psychedelic feel to it there's something about that song that i hear like old b-movie psychedelic rock and roll in the in the kind of sound cool yeah that's awesome wow that's that's fantastic um well, you know, it's funny you say that because this new batch of songs that we're writing has a, a little bit more of like kind of a, what did Tom call it? He called it a psychedelic thrash sandwich. So there you go. We've got a couple of new tunes where like, you know, the, the beginning is fast and the end is fast. But in the middle, there's like these stretchy psychedelic parts where we're kind of uh, messing around with some more sound effects and uh, different things we can do at the live show and stuff. But uh, You Have No Face is uh, uh, Goro uh, ripping your face off, and uh, he peels off the skin, he boils it in the oil, and he eats it like a chip. Wow. That's downright yeah. frightening. That's downright frightening. I, that's, mm-hmm. Listen, this is the holiest week of the year in the Catholic religion. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, maybe I should go down to the local church and talk to Father Matthew and be like, hey, Father Matthew, I got this great album I want you to check out. <laughs> Just interviewed Adrian, the bass player and songwriter. Let me th- let me know what you think of Goro. So maybe you should send him the confession booth. There, there, right. There you go. <laughs> Goro definitely needs to go to confession. 
<laughs> so uh onward to waste of blood and and end to end i love both of these tracks too i hear that kind of doomy sabbathy riff stoner rock feel but yet it's pretty melodic um and again mid song lots of shredding there um and real good guitar in the back end then you go to end to end to end and i feel like this is just a really good good metal song it's heavy and thrashy kind of think that old vintage metallica or motorhead has a good low end groove you kind of hear it feel you kind of keeping the groove down song really really jams out so talk a little bit about both of those tracks um let's see waste of blood is like the newest song on the album um that was we were uh we were actually already in the midst of recording and um we were just jamming out one day playing and uh and tom and avanash were like hey you know is there any any new riffs and i was like yeah here's a riff you know and then like boom next thing you know we're like writing a song and so again the the inspiration just kind of just comes out it flows through us it, it surrounds us and uh we just we get in t- and time goes that's when that's when time gets kind of warped a little bit where we're like oh, okay we're gonna have band practice from seven to nine and then i gotta be home by 10 right and then we get there seven o'clock you know next thing you know we're like we're, we you know we're playing riffs we're throwing around writing next thing you know it's like 11 o'clock at night <laughs> and we're like uh-oh <laughs> you know? yeah. but we walked out of there with a new song so that's that one and then uh that's waste of blood and then um which was actually the lyrics were inspired by a friend of mine that uh, works at the local food bank. And she was telling me uh, I was working at a job where I was very unhappy and she was like, man, that's such a waste of blood. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> Good title. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, again, it was one of those ones where we had the lyrics before the riff. Yep. You know? And then uh, end to end, uh, that's just Tom being Tom, you know, uh, our first drummer, Scott, he said, um, he said, you got anything more metal? Because I was playing a bunch of foo-foo, fruity, fruity riffs from, you know, I was playing like, you know, like Isley Brothers and stuff, you know, uh-huh. like, you know, and then he's like, ah, he's like, got any like real metal riffs? And Tom goes, here, how about this one? And just like, boom, it was, there was it right there. It just happened. And, um, and end to end is uh, it's a song about drugs um, and how Goro is immune to drugs because there's not enough drugs in the earth realm to get him high anymore, which is why he has to consume the souls of the innocent. So that makes him high. Wow. That's heavy stuff, man. That's heavy stuff. (laughs) That's some heavy stuff, bro. (laughs) Well, then you get to the back end of the album, Adrian. And this one, I mean, I know you released this one as a single, but if it's saving maybe one of the best for last, the Archduke of Fear is this thing is just epic, man. It's one of my favorites, probably the favorite. It's just got that classic new brave of, you know, British heavy metal riff. And, you know, you get to that three minute mark and then it gets jammy. And it's like, you know, Tom going off, then you going off. And it, like, I'm like, am I listening to like Black Sabbath's Heaven and Hell, you yeah, know, that- live evil? Like this is like th- the Heaven and Hell track at 11 minutes live. This is like Tony and geezer going at it, man. And then the pace builds back up. It's just, you know, I hear Mastodon qualities to it. And then it just kind of just ends. It's like, wow, man, I want to fucking hit replay on that one again. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. That's, um, that's one, uh, that's another, that's another Tom riff where, you know, we were, um, we were with another drummer that we were working with, um, back a few years ago. And, uh, uh what was his name? Uh, I, I don't know. I forget his name, but anyways, he was a super cool dude. And, um, he was, uh, he was like, you know, let's, let's, let's write a song together. He wanted to really, he really wanted to to write a song and record together. And that was our, that was our spec- third drummer. And this guy was our third drummer. And uh, he really wanted to write a song together because we had been, we had been practicing a few times and we had some songs down and he didn't really want to play any live shows you know so we were like um well then what are we doing you know and then he's like well let's write a song and so uh tom came in with that intro riff and was like and so um so again we just went for it we let the the spirit of the moment kind of take over and uh, a couple days later we had we had archduke of fear and it was pretty much already it was that was a quick one it went came and 
came in and I mean, pretty much the way it is now is, uh, is pretty much like almost as much as like the first day or two that we wrote it. And then, uh, although there is an extra verse at the end now that it's like a ascending thing that Tom wanted to do. And then we recorded that, but then, uh, now there's actually, uh, lyrics for that same part at the end of the song. Yeah. And then, um, and then at the the very very end of the album is uh, that's when we're all dying, yeah. At the end of that song, is uh, there's a point there that's just it's just basically me and Tom and Avinash um, suffering under the attack of Goro and our souls being consumed, and we die. So how does the band get resurrected for the next album? You're already starting to start to write uh, new songs, so you got to bring the character back, or you got to bring the players back. But yeah, yeah, we'll figure that part out. Yeah. <laughs> figure that one out when you get to that one. Yeah, so you, yeah. so you did say that you guys are, you know, you already got uh, more songs being written. Are there other songs, maybe that you know, uh, predecessors to the album out there, or that the fans can listen to, or is this pretty much the eight tracks that are out there? This is pretty much the eight tracks that are out there. Uh, we did a few covers um, to fill out our set, and. Um, there was one song that we wrote like on stage that never got recorded, which I wish it did because I have no idea what we did that we were playing, we were playing a show in Oakland and uh, the crowd was going wild. And we finished our set and the guy was like, you guys got to play one more song. You guys got to play one more song. And I was like, well, how many more songs? And the guy was like, make something up right now. People are going nuts. Like you guys got to do something. (laughs) So I think, uh, I think we played a song in F sharp. And Tom did this wild guitar solo and I screamed and yelled and we jumped up and down and act, acted all silly. And and I, I have no idea what happened to that. And I don't think anyone ever recorded it, but that was our one-off song that we wrote it on stage. And remarkably, we finished at the same time. That was what was incredible about it. Wow, like we, that... we started the song. We had a couple of verses, crazy guitar solo, big thing at the end happened and then we ended up bam 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 and it all ended perfectly and we were like wow okay there's a song see that that's your that's your spinal tap moment and no and nothing to no no proof of it that it ever existed only yeah. again maybe goro will bring that back to you in a dream state for the next album you know things like that do happen with this band Yes, I see that. So so what is playing live like for you guys? Because I don't know if you get out and do any touring. Is it mainly regional shows out in Northern California? Do you get across the state or over to the East Coast, perhaps? Or is it mainly just whenever you can get together and play? Well, we uh, we would like to go everywhere all around the world and uh, and dominate the universe and bring chaos and disorder to the entire globe. Um, however, lately, we've only been able to do it in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area because um, we actually we haven't really had very many opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're trying to get ourselves out there. Um, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we're talking to you and other people that mm-hmm. are doing podcasts and and video uh, video YouTube things and stuff, because, uh, you know, we're 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 available we want to play shows. I've been, uh, I've been sending emails to everybody I know saying, Hey man, you know, we're trying to get out there. You know, we want to bring the, we want to bring the show together so that, um, so that we can just take it everywhere. Uh, one of the things that we like to do is we make a custom, uh, backdrop for every show, mm. uh, with like spray paint and paper and blood. And, uh, and then, uh, at the end of the show, um, if somebody wants it, they can take it. But other times we just, take it in the parking lot and burn it. So. Wow. Well, wow. yeah, it, uh, it gets the, it gets the, it gets the stress, stress out of the show. It's instead of having a couple beers, you, you burn the backdrop. I yeah, love but, it. Yeah. But uh, we're, try, we're trying to get out there. We've, we've done a couple of local shows. We're doing a few more local shows, but uh, we're doing our best to get ourselves out there. And, uh, you know, we want to play as much as we can and bring, bring the live show to the people because uh, again, the more our live show develops, the more uh, the more that the band grows, the live show is going to get bigger and bigger. That's the whole concept about this whole thing. Just, you know, bigger and bigger live show with more crazy, uh, more fantasy, more Goro. Yeah. Well, us, we at Metal, Mor- Metal Mayhem ROC will do our part to showcase uh, the album, make sure the word gets out there. We have a Monday night radio show on Metal Devastation Radio. We'll make sure to get some of the songs on here th- and play them. Um, but Adrian, uh, tell us where we can get all the information on the band, the socials, 
where to buy the album and all that kind of stuff. Um, Bandcamp is the main thing. Uh, Bandcamp.handsofgoro.com, I think. Uh, let me see. What is it? It's, uh, uh, yeah, Bandcamp. Um, that's, uh, yeah, it's uh, handsofgoro.bandcamp.com. That's where uh, that's where you can buy the album right now. There is a um, the vinyl and digital download as well. There's a there's actually a CD being pressed right now uh, via Nameless Grave Records, and um, they're pressing the CD. That should be available soon. Um, other than that, you know, we're we're selling it on our own, man. You know, we're this is a total DIY project. Uh, I approached a bunch of different labels before we even started on this uh, path to vinyl and everyone was like, Oh, you know, we've got too much going on right now. And, you know, oh, I got so many bands, oh, blah, blah, blah. So I said, all right, well, we're going to put it out ourselves then. And we're going to do full on DIY. Um, I, I mean, that there's no other way to do it because nobody else is going to do it for us. So we got to do it ourselves. Uh, we put it out on my uh, our own uh, BSP Records uh, label, which has actually uh, been around for about solid 10 years or so. Uh, mostly put out like seven inches and CDs and stuff like that. But um, this is uh, definitely the um, the good release on that. Um, see uh, where else? Uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram. We're all over that social media stuff, and um, we're just you know. We want to get out there. We want to take it to the people. Um, you know, we got, oh, I made stickers. We have stickers now. I love hands, stickers. Hands of Goro stickers. All right. I got to hit you up after the show for some stickers because I have an old church pew in my home office that's hey. just littered with sti stickers. I need a Goro sticker, man. Hey, I'll send you some stickers. All right. Sounds good. Well, just a reminder, get up to our website, metalmayhemroc.com and join our community. By signing up for our email newsletter, this is the best way to stay updated on new podcast episodes, interviews like this on our YouTube channel, CD and concert reviews, as well as reminders to join us on our live radio show Monday nights on Metal Devastation Radio. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. For my guest, Adrian from Hands of Goro and the soul and the beast of Goro himself. I am Metal Waltz, and this is Metal Mayhem RC. Metal for Life. Thank you for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our website at metalmayhemroc.com for information on podcasts, archives, links to all our live radio shows, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. And always remember to keep it heavy.